if we're going to talk about whether redox reactions occur, about whether or not there has been a change in oxidation number, then we need to be able to pretty um, effortlessly assign oxidation numbers to, to compounds, to be able to look at the atoms sitting inside a um, uh, molecule or an ion and say, oh, the oxidation number is plus 7, or oh, the oxidation number is minus 2. Well, that means then that we need to come up with what the rules are that are associated with assigning oxidation numbers. These rules are typically taught to you in a high school chemistry course, but I repeat them here for you fairly quickly so that you have them um, in your brain and you can start doing them just like that. The first rule, of course, is what we've seen before, that free elements have an oxidation number of zero. So these are elements that um, have no other um, atoms other than a single monatomic species. So um, oxygen in O2 or um, uh, fluorine in F2, um, phosphorus P4, sulfur S8, any of these compounds, because the overall um, uh, compound has only a single atom in it, the oxidation number has to be zero. Now, after we get past all of the elements which are monatomic in the compounds they form, the next step is the one that borrows from what we learned when we were um, uh, studying uh, Lewis dot structures and we understood the need to achieve um, a noble gas-like configuration. What we learned when we were doing those kinds of problems was very simply that if I looked at the periodic table, everything wanted to be like this. Everything wanted to achieve an argon or a neon-like configuration. So over here, elements like lithium and sodium and potassium, they all wanted to lose an electron. And if you lose an electron, you've lost a negative charge, so you're a positive one overall. In this particular column here, things like calcium or magnesium had to lose two electrons. On the opposite side, things like fluorine and chlorine wanted to gain an electron. That was negative one. Um, oxygen, sulfur, that would want to gain an electron. That's two electrons. That's minus two. Um, sitting over here next to them are nitrogen and phosphorus. They wanted to gain three. The other case that we worried about was this one here with something like aluminum. Um, and it would want to lose three. So that's how we assigned oxidation numbers based upon what particular group you were in. All the alkali metals um, were plus one, all the alkali earths were plus two, um, the halogens were minus one, and so on. So the second, and um, certainly the most important rule, the one you use the most, is the rule associated with assigning oxidation numbers by groups. Now, having said that, there comes a point where as you were doing problems, um, assigning oxidation numbers, you suddenly are conflicted. Not always, but sometimes. If I showed you a water, for example, and I asked you to assign oxidation numbers here, you would say, well, that one's a minus 2, and that's a plus 1. That makes everybody happy, you notice, because I can set up this nice little equation that says the overall charge on the molecule or ion, 0 in this case, is equal to, and then there's this number of coefficients times the oxidation number that you add together for all of the different atoms to see if that equals zero. So let's see, if I've got an oxygen right here, this is my oxygen case here, and these are my hydrogens, uh, the oxygen, there's one of them, and it has a minus two charge. The hydrogen has two um, hydrogens, and it has a plus one charge. What do you know? It all adds up perfectly. Two times plus one, one times minus two, it all adds to zero. Check, everyone's happy. When that occurs, everybody's very pleased because it means everybody has gotten to do what they want to do just fine. Um, the problem is that not all compounds work this way. Let's take something like H2O2 or something like NaO. Now, in this particular case here, um, these are both neutral, so I have to have them all add up to zero. And there's two atoms in both cases, two types of atoms. So I've got to multiply together the atoms times their oxidation number. Let's go ahead and do this top one here. There are two oxygens, and it wants to be minus two. 
there are two hydrogens and they want to be plus one. Down here we've got um, one oxygen and it wants to be minus two, one sodium and it wants to be plus one. When I do this, uh-oh, guess what? Two plus minus four does not equal zero. One plus minus two does not equal zero. Evidently, my simple little rule one and rule two about assigning oxidation numbers isn't going to work here. So I need to have a hierarchy for the assigning of the oxidation numbers that says if there's ever a conflict between elements and trying to assign based upon rule number one about uh, the actual uh, um, uh, charge associated with the group, whenever there's that kind of conflict, there has to be a hierarchy. Something's always going to win. Something's always going to come in second place. And here are what the rules are. So when I've got alkali metals, they are always plus one. Always plus one unless they're um, in the elemental form. So when I had sodium and oxygen together, sodium got to win. It got to be plus one and oxygen had to conform. So when I was looking at that particular problem, with sodium oxide, um, I didn't get to call oxygen minus two. What got to rule the roost was sodium being plus one, so the oxygen had to be minus one, and then it did work. Let's try this case here. Hydrogen is always plus one, except for when it's around sodium. And therefore, if it's around something like hydrogen peroxide, it gets to be plus one. And once again, the oxygen comes in second place. And so now, by oxygen being minus one, I have been able to um, make my equality hold. So generally speaking, there's this sort of hierarchy that we establish that works this way. Things like sodium always win over hydrogen, and things like hydrogen always win over things like oxygen. This one always gets to be plus one. This one always gets to be plus one, except when it's around sodium. This one always gets to be minus two, except when it's around hydrogen or it's around sodium. So let's look at Na2H, something weird like that. There's Na2H. I don't really know a whole lot about this compound. All I know is that it's neutral, and it involves a couple of different atoms. So there are two sodiums, and there is one hydrogen. This one has to be plus one. So whether I like it or not, I've been forced to make hydrogen minus two because of this hierarchy I have. So as long as you keep this hierarchy in mind, you're going to be in good shape. Now there's one other rule that you need to be aware of, and it's the rule associated with what I call everything else. When I've gone and created an, a periodic table here where I'm taking care of my main group guys, so I'm taking care of these guys right here, I'm taking care of these guys over here, everything else is pretty much up for grabs. Everything else from the transition metals all the way over to even dealing with things like carbon and nitrogen. Those have a highly variable um, possible oxidation number. So let me show you some compounds to give you a sense of this. Here's some NH3. Here's some NO3 minus. Here's some Cr2O7 double minus. Here's some uh, KMNO4. There we go four examples of an effort to assign oxidation number to these particular compounds here. The nice thing about assigning oxidation numbers to these compounds is that it becomes really very much a rote sort of process. <coughs> I would imagine that I'm going to know what K is and O is and O and O and H, that I've got those numbers assigned based upon rules that I established earlier. The things I'm not going to know about are these more exotic species, the nitrogen, the chromium, and the manganese. The, in fact, it turns out those can be quite variable in terms of their oxidation number. And so I need to follow the following guidelines. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up these equalities here. 
And I'm going to set um, these equalities up so that the overall charge of the compound sits on the right-hand side. This is overall 0. This one's overall minus 1. This is overall minus 2. And this is overall 0. Now what goes on the left-hand side is going to be this um, multiplic multiplication together of the oxidation number and the number of atoms for however many there are. So there are two kinds of atoms in this first case, two kinds in the second case, uh, two kinds in this third case, and three kinds in this fourth case. And now I just stick the numbers in that I know of and solve for what I don't know. In this top case here, I know that there's one nitrogen, and I know that there are three hydrogens, and I know that hydrogen, except when it's around oxygen or sodium, gets to be plus one. Nitrogen, I don't know it, but notice that because I know everything else, that's plus three, that's a one there, the answer is that this hydrogen must be minus three for its oxidation number. Let's try this case here with nitrate. Notice I've got one nitrogen and I've got three oxygens. The oxygens get to be minus two, except around hydrogen and sodium. That means that this right here, this unknown value, is what my nitrogen is. And it is, huh, if it has to add to minus one, it must be plus five. Because plus five plus three times minus two equals minus one. So my nitrogen here is plus five for its oxidation number. Look at that. My nitrogen has gone from minus three to plus five. This suggests a huge change, an eight electron change in the number of, number of electrons. Uh, by the way, notice that this is um, uh, associated with some pretty important chemical processes. Ammonia here is a source of fertilizer, right? And nitrate is this kind of waste product that does pretty much not a whole lot for us. It's associated with smog and that kind of thing. But the process of getting from this fertilizer to the smog-like substance right here releases an enormous amount of energy, and that energy release is associated with an eight electron flow. Our ability to monitor that eight electron flow is what electrochemistry is all about. Now down here are some other more exotic species. You may not even know what this thing is. It's called dichromate. This is called potassium permanganate. But what you do need to know is what the oxidation numbers are for the chromium and the manganese. Because if you know what they are, then you can know whether a redox process has taken place when you look at it inside a chemical reaction. So I've got two chromiums. I've got seven oxygens, which are minus two. Put the numbers in here. That's minus 14. That must make this plus six because 12 plus minus 14 is minus 2. So my chromiums each have a plus 6 value here. Down here is permanganate. Um, so I've got uh, potassium, and there's two of them, and they must be a plus 1, because potassium is always plus 1. There's my oxygen. There's four of them, and they're a minus 2. Now you might be asking, why is it getting to be minus 2 if it's around the potassium? And the answer is, if I've got something else that I can unload the burden of fixing the number of electrons in the oxidation number on, that's what gets the burden. That's the manganese here that has to make that accommodation. So at this point, I've got plus 2 overall here. I've got minus 8 overall there. What are the numbers that I have to add up here to get the end result that I have? And the answer is, oh, plus 6, because plus 2 plus 1 times plus 6 plus minus 8 is, in fact, equal to 0. So the manganese also has a plus 6 oxidation number. This is how you assign oxidation numbers. And you might think, yuck, I don't want to keep doing this. But the nice thing is that after a while, being able to assign oxidation numbers doesn't require you to do this. You can look at chemical compounds and do this kind of math in your head. What it allows you to do, though, is the very next step, the step of being able to assign um, um, and balance um, chemical reactions that involve oxidation and reduction. And once you've been able to do that, you can talk about whether or not you have a process which is electrochemical in nature or not. Remember, what we're getting back to when all of this is said and done is, am I able to monitor whether electrons are moving, whether electrons, in fact, can fall down a hill? Well, if those electrons don't move, I'm not doing electrochemistry. Those electrons are not moving in a sodium chloride dissociation. Those electrons are not moving in an acid-base reaction. 
those electrons are not moving when I'm having a physical process take place. It is only in processes in which I have a change in the number of electrons happening that that will occur. And I can only know if there's a change in the number of electrons by figuring out the oxidation numbers and then taking a look at a chemical reaction like this one right here and saying, wow, it started as plus one and ended as zero. So evidently, this is an electrochemical process. This is something where I can measure the energy associated with that electron movement.